name's Clive Letchford and I teach Latin and Greek language here at Warwick. But I'm also really interested in uh, plays, Greek tragedy and comedy. And I've been really excited to see how much uh, interest there's been in this country about Greek plays over the past 12 months or so. We've seen uh, The Globe, The Oris Star has been put on. We've seen at the Royal National Theatre. We have seen Medea, which has been live to cinemas around the world. We've seen uh, also that the Amida has had a huge uh, Greek season, again with another example of The Oris Star. And just down the road, strapped on Avon, they did a version of Euripides... Helen. All sorts of interesting things going on, and it's great to be able to put on uh, Lysistrata here as part of our own little contribution to this Greek flourishing that's going on. So Lysistrata is exploring various issues, and we might think this is quite strange uh, in a play, but in fact when you think about things in modern plays, we're doing that all the time. In one of the ones that comes to mind is Jerusalem. About three or four years ago, the uh, character of Johnny Rooster, who is uh, at the bottom of society, very famous play, well received. But also we are using some of the Greek plays to uh, investigate modern issues. For example, the Oristar at the Almeida had Agamemnon, king of men, the politician. He looked extremely like Tony Blair in the way he controlled the media, the way he was putting uh, politics before his principles, before his family. And it's a natural thing to do, I think, to explore things. And this is precisely what the Athenians were doing in their plays and why the Sistrata is still a very interesting play to study and think about. Aristophanes was writing the Lysistrata in 411 BC. Now, they had all sorts of wars going on, basically for the previous century, which is why the idea of peace was particularly relevant to him. But what was quite interesting about this was, at this stage, the Athenians had been fighting the Spartans. But that hadn't always been the case. Uh, back at the previous century, you might well have heard about the battles of Marathon, the Battle of Salamis, the sea battle there, or the Battle of Thermopylae. You might even have seen the film 300. Part of the play is looking at the fact that they had been allies, they had been friends and had helped each other in key situations, but now why on earth were they fighting each other? But they're also fed up with the war at this stage, and so the central f part of the, war, of the play is to have peace at any terms between the Athenians and the Spartans. The Sistrata is a comedy, and with all comedies it deals with stereotypes, and this has, I think, four main stereotypes it deals with. The first one is looking at women, and the whole plot works around the idea of that women are sex mad. They're absolutely gagging for it, and that is going to bring about what they want. The second thing that comes in from time to time is that they really like a good drink. So it's a bit like shades of, uh, uh, shades of Bridget Jones and her predilection for Chardonnay. The third thing that they uh, look at is giving women power. Now, this is uh, inverting the stereotype. In Athens, women had very little power in terms of being kept within the household, not even going out to do the shopping. That's the thing that their husbands did. So they invert that and have the idea of what happens if women do have power, what are the implications, possibly frightening for the men in the audience. The fourth stereotype is to do with nationality and peoples. We think about, in this country, maybe uh, Scousers, Geordies, or even our local Brummies, great people. There, each city really was a people and had its own different characteristics. So we have the Athenians, who are, of course, the good guys. It's an Athenian play. They're making peace with the Spartans. They're kind of very outdoor, strong, fit types. Uh, they, but they also have people like Boeotians, and they're very fond of their eels. So he's working on that and making fun of it uh, to propel the play forward. Some people think the idea of a sex strike might just be too outlandish to be believable. It's just beyond the bounds of possibility. Well, in some ways, this is a comedy, and a lot of Aristophanes' comedies are pushing things to the limits. One of them, he has a hero rising up to the heavens on the back of a giant dung beetle. But indeed, the idea of a sex strike has taken root. Uh, just down the road, uh, in the beginning of 1970, 
when the car workers, the British Leyland, were on strike, the women said, until you go back to work, uh, we will deny you your, um, your marriage rights, as it were, and actually uh, enforce that. And in fact, the men eventually, of course, did go back to work. But another more recent example in Liberia, uh, in Africa, uh, the women were forced for uh, trying to get uh, get the terrible civil war moving forward in a good direction to peace. And they also used the idea of a sex strike with their husbands to try and bring about peace. Now, in some ways, as the leader said, well, it was a publicity stunt, really. Uh, uh, but it got us attention, which is what we needed, and it did move us forward. And in the end, she was an amazing woman. She actually got the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 for her work, but she used this as a tactic. So how does Aristophanes use this idea of the sex strike in terms of getting peace? Well, really, it falls into four parts. The first part, we get Lysistrata calling the women of Greece together and outlining her plan to them, that is, no sex with your husbands until we have peace. And this was the women throughout Greece, so the people on the opposing side as well would bring pressure on their husbands. The second part is actually a subplot, and that involves occupying the Acropolis. Now, the Acropolis was the central part of Athens. You might well have seen the Parthenon on top of it. But they kept an awful lot of money on there, and they were forced to use it. It was there for emergencies, but they were forced to use it at this time in the war. So she takes some other women to occupy it to stop the Athenian men in getting their hands on it. So that's drying up funds for the war, which is a kind of secondary part of what they need to do. We then go back in the play to the third part. We do have uh, the women uh, coming back. And we see an example of one particular Athenian woman denying her husband his uh, marriage rights, as it were. And she's playing around with him. She's the one in control, and she tricks him. He doesn't get it. Then, towards the end, we have people come back from Sparta. We find that it has worked. The Spartans are ready to sue for peace. The Athenian men are ready to sue for peace. So she brings in the figure of reconciliation which it actually brings as a non-speaking character onto the stage uh, to bring this peace between the two men. So at the end as often with Aristophanes we have a happy conclusion by fairly unlikely means but as a happy ending they have got what they want. Of course, this is all wish fulfilment. They're in the middle of a war. They've had a terrible reverse two years before. They've just had uh, democracy taken away from them because they've done so badly. So this is a kind of right light relief, and if only we could do this.